What's happening? Gotcha. How you doing, Chiefs? All right. Who said that? <laughs> I hear you. Hey, something I want to touch on that I heard Dr. Dr. Bumgarner talking about and something that you can do as a chief. So someone in the back had asked about, can you take the running component of the fitness test first? So I'll tell you yes. And I'll tell you as a chief, you can influence that. This is how I know. When I was at the Warfare Center, we had a problem with airmen taking the PT test the last week of the month. We've all seen it because they may not have worked out like they should and they're worried they want to wait till the last day of the month to take the PT test. And what they did on Nellis Air Force Base is they incentivized airmen if you took the PT test the first two weeks of the month. And if you decided that you were going to take the test the first two weeks of the month, you could run first if you wanted to. You could run first if you wanted to. What I'll tell you, Chiefs, is you influence that, you can make that happen. That's at the lowest level for approval, and I believe for us it was the FSS commander who decided that's what they were going to do to try to address the throughput toward the end of the month. Good incentive, I think. Just something to think about, food for thought, but if you have that same kind of issue, if you're worried about lactic acid and all those kinds of things, influence it. Make sense? All right. I get to talk about some AFPC stuff, some bombs dropping and all those kinds of things. No bombs dropping at AFPC, I can tell you that. Hey, what I'm going to do and what I want, I only have eight slides that I'm going to talk about. And in the middle of those slides, at the end of those slides or whatever, if you have questions about AFPC, I want you to ask me. And I want to hopefully instill in you the direction that AFPC is going and then also this whole culture change that we're trying to do and then why the culture change. All right. I'm supposed to do that. All right, AFPC A1, Commander Philosophy. So we recently changed our mission. And to most chiefs, you're like, hey, that's not a big deal, Kenny. I don't care that you guys change your mission. But there's a why behind the reason we changed the mission. Our previous mission was one team, one family, one mission, taking care of airmen. And the reason we changed that is I had a conversation with our previous commander, Lieutenant General Kelly, and he asked me, what does that do for me? What's that mission statement do for me? And I said, sir, it does absolutely nothing to me. It doesn't make me feel any kind of way. It's vague, it's bland, and it doesn't get after me. It doesn't inspire me to do anything. And so we talked about changing it, and we wanted to change it for the technicians at AFPC. So we changed it to the mission statement at the bottom, agile, innovative, and responsive, feeling the fight. What we're trying to do with that is, if you're a technician at AFPC, and you're behind a computer screen, you're behind a phone call, what we want you to believe or think about is any action I take, I should be fueling the fight. That should drive airmen, our airmen, to say yes more times than not. We understand currently that's not what's going on, but that's what we're driving toward. We're trying to make a personnelist see themselves in the mission. And the only way a personnelist can see themselves in the mission, they have to understand that whatever they do, they're trying to influence the fight in Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq and all those places. That's why the change in mission statement. So some of you might say, yeah, whatever, doesn't make sense, I don't like it or whatever, but we're trying to drive a certain culture with those technicians who are just behind computer screens and doing things. We can actually enable to fight if we say yes more times than not. We're a team. And when I say we're a team, I talk about the entire A1 enterprise. So that starts at the squadron level with the CSSs, the MPSs, the MAGCOMs, AFPC and half. We're all one team. And General Kelly's outlook and General Toast's outlook and that, what that means is if there is a mistake that's made, let's say at your MPS, and when it gets to AFPC, if we can say as a community the A1 Enterprise made the mistake, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. So we're not going to say the MPS did it, we're sorry, or it happened at AFPC, or it happened at the squadron, you guys need to take care of it. If we mess up in the A1 enterprise, we're going to make it right. And what we're trying to do is not put the burden back on the airman or the commander to tell them, hey, you need to submit an exception to policy to make it right, though we made a mistake within the A1 enterprise. We're going to make it right within the entire enterprise. Executing at the gold standard. So I'm going to share a story with you. What's the gold standard? So that, that's a culture that we're trying to drive toward. And when we came up with gold standard, 
Again, I was asked the question, what's that mean to you? I'll tell you, gold standard is personal to me. And so I have an image, I have a story on what gold standard is. And so I talked to General Kelly about what gold standard means to me. And if you could just bear with me for a second, I'll give you my example of the gold standard. And then think about this is how we want people to think when you interact with us. So my gold standard, American Airlines. I don't care what you say, what you think, that is my gold standard airline. I fly other airlines, but American Airlines is my gold standard. And this is why. So my parents were in New Orleans during Katrina. So August 2006, I had talked to my mom, and she said, hey, me and your dad are going to just you know, wait it out just like we always do in New Orleans. Your dad's going to go to work, and I'm going to go to your grandma's house, and we'll just set through the hurricane. Hurricane passes, everything's fine. I'm stationed at Wheeler Army Airfield in Hawaii, and I got a brother who was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas. Storm goes through, everything's good. Talk to our parents, everybody's fine. The levees break. When the levees break, we're unable to talk to our parents. So about a day into it, my brother ends up contacting my mom. My mom is fine. She had gotten evacuated with my grandma and one of my aunts. So they're in Texas. My dad, my dad had worked for the sheriff's department, and I saw my dad on CNN transporting prisoners. I'm like, well, heck, we hadn't talked to dad, but dad's fine because I saw him transporting prisoners. And I saw him on CNN for two days in a row transporting prisoners. So I knew my dad was okay. Four days passed, we still can't contact my dad, so I call the sheriff's department where they had all evacuated to. And I talked to a man, I said, hey, trying to look for my dad, James Lindsay, this is what he looks like, this is the last time I saw him. He says, oh, he says, your dad went back to New Orleans. I'm like, why did my dad go back to New Orleans? He went back to New Orleans to get your mom because he said your mom was at your grandma's house. And I'm like, oh crap, you know, New Orleans is like six foot underwater, I don't know what he's doing. So they had dropped my dad off on a bridge in New Orleans. And what my dad thought is I'm going to come off the bridge, I'm going to walk to my mother-in-law's house, I'll get my wife and everything's going to be fine. What he didn't account for is my grandma lived about two miles away and the water was over six foot high. So he went back and forth from the top of the bridge into the water. He'd go back to the top and says, okay, I've got to wait until the water goes down and I'll be okay. In New Orleans, you know, generally 24 hours, the water is gone and you're good to go. So my dad goes from the top of this bridge to the bottom for four days in a row. Remember, August in New Orleans. He finally goes back up to the top of the bridge, and there was a bread truck that was stalled out. He sets in the wheel well of this bread truck, and he says, I guess I'm supposed to die like this. And he was done. No food, no water for the four days that he was on the bridge. He passes out. And when he passes out, a Coast Guard helicopter spots him in uniform, hovers overhead, ends up landing on a bridge, grabs my dad, a bunch of IVs and stuff, and they evacuate him. They evacuate him to another part of Texas. He ends up calling me while I'm in Hawaii. He said, hey, you know, got, got evacuated. Here's all kind of what happened to me. And I said, yeah, I saw you on CNN. What, you know, what was going on? He, I was going to get your mom, all those kinds of things. He said, where's your mom at? I said, she's in Texas with Brian. So Brian's my brother. She's in Texas with Brian. He says, okay. He says, I'm going to catch a bus from Louisiana to Texas. And I said, Dad, you're not catching a doggone bus from Louisiana to Texas. I'm going to fly you from Louisiana to Texas. And he says, you probably can't. He says, I don't have any identification. I lost my gun, lost my wallet. My uniform's kind of ate up from the water. I don't, I don't look like me anymore, so I probably can't fly. And I said, you let me take care of that. And I said, I'll, I'll call you back. And at this time, he's in a shelter. I call American Airlines. And I give them the entire story about my dad. I said, here's what's going on. Katrina survivor, separated from my mom. This is what I'm trying to do. I need to get him a ticket from Louisiana to Texas. And so the lady and I talk back and forth, and she asked me what my dad looks like, so I describe him. And she says, you know, I, th I think we can square your dad away. So just think about this. I I'm at Wheeler Army Airfield in Hawaii, and I'm thinking, you better not mess this one up. You better not mess this one up. So pay for the tickets. She says, tell your dad to come to the airport, and, and we'll take care of him. So I get off the phone with her, and I call my dad. I said, hey, dad, go to the airport tomorrow at 8 in the morning, and they said they're going to take care of you. And he says, how? I don't have anything. I said, they said they're going to take care of you, Dad. That's all I have. They said they can take care of you. He's like, okay. So we get off the phone. Next morning, my dad goes to the airport. And sure enough, American Airlines take care of him. What my dad tells me by the time he links up with my mom, he says, you know, when I got to the airport, he says, right when I said my name, they pulled me to the back. They fed me. They clothed me. They put me in first-class seating. 
and then they link me up with your mom. Wow. My dad is a man who is not emotional. It broke him down. So when I think a gold standard, that's the image I see. That's what I think about. That's what I feel. That's not just words that are on a slide that says, hey, we operate the gold standard. Our goal is to operate the gold standard. The gold standard is something you feel. And what I'll tell you is every one of you have a similar type story or you have a similar type airman that needs to be taken care of at the gold standard level. That's what we're striving toward. That's what we're striving toward. We provide world-class combat support and customer service. I'll tell you, we're still we're rolling in that direction. We're not there yet. That's what we're rolling toward. To do that, we have to be disciplined and we have to pay attention to detail. If you got one of those 0.00, .00 checks, you understand about paying attention to detail. We got to do a better job of taking or paying attention to the details. Chiefs, if you're not having fun, something's wrong with you. Don't take yourself too serious. Anyone who really knows Kenny Lindsay, they will tell you in that guy's head, there's a party going on every single day because that is me. That's who I am. That keeps me balanced. If you're not having fun, I said a party. If you're not having fun, something's wrong, Chiefs. If you're not having fun, something's wrong. And then winning teams, they always have fun. You never play for second place. You never play for second place. All right, this is going to be a slide of our AFPC Directorate Superintendents. For you, I want this to be your entry point into AFPC. So I don't want you to call your buddy that you know with an AFPC. I don't want you to call an airman that you want supervised. I want you to go directly to our superintendents. And that way you can cut through the middle, all the red tape and stuff, and you can make things happen a lot quicker if you go direct to the superintendents. Don't worry about taking pictures. You guys are going to get this slide deck. We have six, direct, six directors within AFPC. I'm going to show you just four because four are the ones that you all will normally interact with on a weekly, monthly, whatever basis. So our Airman and Family Care Director, DPS, what we call it, Senior Master Sergeant Eleanor Colmer. She's a superintendent for that directorate. All things Airman and Family, all things. So your wounded warriors, all those different things that deal with family care, our DPF takes care of it. Those are some of the things that they do within that directorate. DP1. DP1 is our, our total force service center. That's who our airmen, that's who you all call more times than not. That's that infamous 0102 number. And who knows what happens once you guys call that number. DP1. So Clint Wilkerson, Chief Wilkerson, he is the superintendent of DP1. Right now, an airman will tell you that's their entry point into AFPC. When something goes in a DP1 and how our directorates are set up, DP1 is our first tier within AFPC that does things, airmen type things, retirements, all those different things goes to DP1 first. If our technicians in DP1 have an issue or they can't resolve your problem, it goes to our DP2. And then if it's a deception policy, it'll go to DP3. This is what I want you to know about DP1 and if you call as a chief, if you get a hold of one of our airmen, and you're trying to make something make sense, or you're saying, hey, I need you to think about this, I need you to use your head, this doesn't make sense to me, Airman, this is what I want you to understand. They're working off of scripted information. So you might say, hey, I got what you just said, but this is what I'm trying to do. You're going to get a scripted answer back to you. And then once they reach their capacity, they're going to move it to the next directorate. So know when you call on AFPC, if you call into our TFSC, understand what you're getting right when you call that organization. I'd much rather you call the, the director at superintendents because you'll get things resolved a lot quicker. Another reason I don't want you to go to your buddy in AFPC because if you have a problem and if you get hooked up because somebody took care of you, it never gets to the level of leadership to fix it. In order for us to fix it, we have to see it. That's why I want you to go through the director at superintendents. Make sense? All right, DP2. DP2, Rebecca Baxter. Did that come up? Right there. Rebecca DP2, all things operations. That's our biggest directorate, and they do a lot of lifting within AFPC. So that's our, our junior, a lot of our senior CEOs are in DP2. They are our subject matter experts. 
Normally, when you all are doing something with an AFPC, it's sitting at DP2, all right? What you need to know about Chief Baxter, very responsive, but also she is the chief that will give you options. If you want to do something particular, she'll help you out, and she may not give you the answer that you want, but she will provide options on he, these are the things that we can do in that particular situation. DP3, Chad Pryor. Chad Pryor, all things policy. Exceptions to policy. You want to do something that's a little non standard, you're going to go through Chad Pryor. Y'all still taking pictures. Boy, chiefs don't listen. Y'all don't care. <laughs> all right. Chief Rose with AFPC. What I mean by that is before you contact AFPC, there are some things you need to do as a chief before you reach out and try to get things done. And also some things I want you to think about. So first, transparent feedback. Transparent feedback. Coordinate, communicate with your MFMs, your CFMs, and also your command chiefs. It's hard for me to execute when I have squadron superintendent who comes directly to me and asks me a question, or, hey, Kenny, can you guys do X? And it doesn't seem like it's been vetted properly, and then I reach back out to the command chief, and the command chief says, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's a foul. That's a foul. So make sure you do your part as far as coordination when you're trying to square away airmen. Because what I do is I always reach back to make sure everyone has seen this. Okay? When you work with a technician in AFPC, please, 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 courtesy copy a superintendent. You don't have to courtesy copy the right superintendent. Courtesy copy one of my superintendents, and they'll make sure that the right superintendent gets the information. That's so we can flight follow, so we can make sure that we are being responsive and answering your needs. Exceptions of policy. I need honesty from you, and I need transparency. So what we often do, because of the way AFIs are set up, when we do an exception of policy, we try to write it catered to the AFI. If the AFI says you must have XYZ, we try to write it to XYZ. I'm going to ask you not to do that. What I want you to do is be completely honest and transparent. This is what I'm trying to do. This is the outcome. I think it's humanitarian, but I am not sure. Help me. Be honest with us. Be transparent with us. And I guarantee you, we're not going to force you into an AFI. Hey, it says you can't do it, so you can't. So a lot of times I'll get feedback from chiefs, from my MAGCOM folks out here, and I'll say, Kenny, AFPC said no. And I'll say, okay, that doesn't make sense to me. Who said no? And they'll say, AFPC. I'm like, God, Lee, tell me who. So when someone tells you no in AFPC, get a name, and then document it. Because when I, when I get AFPC said no, and it doesn't make sense to me, I need to know what director that came out of, and I want to make sure that the superintendent was aware of that no. So along the lines of justification, you'll get a, a response back, or an airman gets a response back, and we'll say justification, not strong enough, need you to resubmit. I don't even know who the heck the justification person is in AFPC to say, yeah, that's justified. So what I'll tell you is when you get a justification not strong enough, technician, director it, document it, and then make sure when you filter that through your chain that I get that information. More times than not, the justification is strong enough. It depends on who's interpreting the justification. So I want our superintendents, I want me or I want my boss to say that justification is not strong enough. I don't want a tech sergeant telling you justification is not strong enough, and then we just stamp it all the way up the chain. Static closeout dates. Kenny, this don't make sense. I'm a chief. I know this stuff. This is why this is so important. We've done a poor job of turning in EPRs in time. So some of that's on the A1 Enterprise, but some of that's on us as chiefs as far as looking back at our airmen to make sure they're squared away. The impact of that, if we don't have reports in on time and we hit file freeze, that airman automatically goes into a supplemental process. The problem with that is the airman knows I signed my report two months ago, results came out, I don't have a score sheet, what's going on? And because we bounced it back and forth, 
we say, well, you didn't make it in time, you're going to the supplemental process, and that's not going to come out for another four months. We can't do that. We can't do that. Let's make sure that once we stamp an EPR, we watch it go through, that we see it to, to, to the end. And that's through your NPS or whomever. Make sure airmen's reports are to us before file freeze because we are doing a disservice to some of our airmen and they have no idea what's going on. All right, assignment stuff. So I'm going to talk just a little bit, actually in a later slide. Talent management um, and things that you can do as a chief. I'm going to talk about it right now. Talent management, things you can do as a chief. AFSOC did it and we were doing it in AFPC. You know how you get that airman who's in a certain job and you want to move them somewhere because they got a particular skill set and you say, man, this is the right airman for that job and, and this is the why behind it. We have the ability in AFPC to move airmen based on talent management. What you can't do is move airmen based on, man, they really want to go there and their kids, you know, they love that, that district and that school and let's move them because of that. Operationally, mission-wise, why are we moving airmen? And if you have a story why that airman skill set is so important they got to move to base x tell us that story and we can make those movements happen like i said afsoc did it had a senior master sergeant in afpc who had hit the retirement button had a particular skill set afsoc said hey we need that senior master sergeant to come to afsoc to stand up x based on his skill set no one else in that career field has that particular skill set the senior master sergeant was willing to pull his retirement papers to move to herbert field Sure enough, we, we made the move happen, the PCS to Herbert Field. He's a chief now. Is, is he even in here? Where yet? Ha ha! Look at there. Not even lying. Congratulations. I should have got you up here and told your own story. Ha ha ha. Anyhow, we, we moved Chief D because of his particular skill set and got him into AFSOC, made chief, but he's doing great things in AFSOC based on that particular skill set that he had. So we can move airmen based on talent. We can't move airmen based on, my heart says we should move them, okay? AFPC, we're doing something similar with our chiefs. We have chiefs there who are on SIPs. And what we're picking up on is some of our chiefs, even though they're in a SIP position, they probably don't have the right set of skills to work that particular SIP. So in-house, we're actually just moving folks, working with the chiefs group, and say we're going to move this airman, this chief from this position to this position because they're better suited for this particular job. Exercise that as much as you can, but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. DSD, nominate the right airman. Nominate the right airman. And I'll tell you, I don't care what pressures you're getting as far as you got an airman who is qualified. If they're not the right airman, don't nominate them. If they're not the right airman, don't nominate them. A situation I was in a couple of years ago where we nominated someone for recruiter duty. They're going through the speed cap process, and the command chief reaches out to me and says, hey, Kenny, can we pull that person from the speed cap process? And I said, why? He says, oh, they don't want to be a recruiter. I said, you freaking signed the dang paper. What, what are you talking about? Well, we wanted to be an LS instructor. So in that situation, I wasn't willing to pull that person out the speed cap process because the command chief and all the chiefs from group on down said that was the right airman to be a recruiter. Once they went through the speed cap process, my hands were off of them. So make sure when you nominate, you're nominating the right people. Joint spouse intent codes. Make sure that when your airmen are, are meal to meal, that their intent codes are the same. You'd be completely amazed at how many airmen we have that are married who have, I don't want to be with my spouse, on their intent codes. The problem with that is once we put someone on assignment, and if it's joint spouse, if we go and look at the intent codes and they say they don't want to be together, it's hard to put them back together. So make sure your airmen, make sure you have the right intent codes unless you don't want to be with your significant other. All right, Talent Marketplace, really quick, what Talent Marketplace is, that's the new officer assignment system. The reason I want to share it with you is because our special warfare airmen are doing a test where they're going to put enlisted folks into Talent Marketplace, and we're going to see if we can utilize it for our enlisted airmen. Down the road, I guarantee you we're going to be in this model for assignments, but it's probably, probably looking at 2021 before you actually see it where it's evolving and things like that. A really good assignment system, it is not, you know, 100% right yet, and we know that, but it's pretty good. So, what does, or what Talent Marketplace does? Of course, it meets warfighting requirements. Increases visibility of potential jobs to officers. 
to commanders, hiring authorities. And then it incorporates the gaining commander's input to the equation as well. What it does not do, solve our officer shortages, meet preferences that we can't meet. And it's not 100% right yet because we're still trying to you know, evolve that actual system and make it right the way we want it. And then you still have to have an element of art when you're doing assignments. That's always going to take place in any assignment system that we come up with. This is what the dashboard looks like. So in short, what an officer will get, I'm on a VML, so that vulnerable move list, and I know I got to go someplace. And let's just say I want to go to Georgia. My FSC, I know it's in Georgia. That's where I want to go. I pull up a map, and I can click Georgia. And I can put my rank in, put my FSC in, and it'll give me all the jobs that are available in Georgia that fit my FSC. And then if I see a job that I really want, I can bid on that job. And so I can say, Psh, that's the job I want to go to. I can look at the commander's comments and see what they're looking for, skill set wise and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a couple other questions that I'd have to answer. So a, a commander who's hiring can look at it and say, hey, Kenny Lindsay applied for this job. This is what he's looking for. This is his background. This is his skill set. This is what he brings to the organization. And then that commander can bid on me if they want. The other thing about Talent Marketplace is if I wanted to go to Georgia and I hit the button and said, yep, that's where I want to go, I can see how many people have applied for that job as well. So if, if there's one position and 20 people have applied for it and I apply for it, man, my shots are pretty slim for getting that job. So I might want to go to my second you know, choice of location and stuff to find a different job. But there's a lot of transparency in Talent Marketplace and it's very user friendly. Execution, I'll go right to future. So future, right now, 19, we just now added all officer AFSCs into Talent Marketplace. We initially started with aviators, now we have all of our officers in it. And like I said before, we got our special warfare airmen who are doing a test within Talent Marketplace right now to kind of see how it's going to work out for enlisted. We're considering putting 365 day deployments in a Talent Marketplace, as well as our DSD stuff in there as well. We just got to see how it works once we start messing with the enlisted side of Talent Marketplace. And then you can see the feedback results that we're getting from the officer community. Bam! How about that? So I'm done with my slides. I'm almost right on time. Any questions? No questions? Yes, sir. We're considering doing it, yep. No, it's still going to be vetted, but we can see what airmen want to go to a certain job. We're still going to vet it. But if it, it, right now we want to see who actually wants to be in DSD. Once you see it, that becomes, now let's do a checks and balances process that goes back to that supervisory chain to say, yep, airman fits the bill. As opposed to, I want to go to San Antonio, so I'm going to apply for this job because I know it's in San Antonio. So we're still going to vet. And we don't, have, we don't even have the rule set for DSD yet. We just, based on the, the population size, we know that it's feasible to go into talent marketplace. The, the how and the checks and balances, we don't know yet. Okay. Anybody else? Cool. Hey, I'm going to give you all, since you're chiefs, one little, it's not tidbit information, but it's something I want you to think about. So back in high school, I, I was like a world-class athlete in track and field. Love track and field. But when I look at chiefs in the Air Force, what I think about is a relay team. So I did the 4 by 400 Oh, Heather's got a question. What you got, Heather? I don't want to interrupt your story. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I was on the 4 by 400 meter relay team. And when you think about a team, when you look at rank in the Air Force, when I think of that 400 meter relay team, I see the, our airmen as those, those just brand new one and two stripers. They're the first leg on a relay team. Anyone who runs track, you know, first leg, you don't know a whole lot about this track meet. Or I don't know a lot about this relay team, but I can run like hell. That's what I know. That's our airmen. They can run like hell. You wind them up and you let them go. Little direction, they just move. First leg, you're trying to get a lead in track and field if you're running on a relay team. Second leg. Second leg's a little bit more mature, and yeah, I kinda, I've done this before. I'm, I'm seasoned, 
I'm not the best on the team, but I'm pretty good. And I understand my role, my job is to try to extend the lead or get the lead if my first leg didn't give me the lead. That's what our second leg does. So when I see the second leg, I believe that's our senior airman staff sergeant, second leg on a relay team. Third leg. Third leg's a person that's pretty dang seasoned, and they can kind of look at the attitude of the team and say, you know, I, I need to do X to make sure when I give that fourth leg the stick that they're going to win because I gave them a lead or I put them in position to win. When I look at third leg, that's where I see our senior tech sergeants, master sergeants, and our senior master sergeants. That's that third leg. When I look at chiefs, when I look at chiefs, you're the fourth leg of a relay team. That's the anchor leg. What's the expectation of the anchor leg? Win. To win, to win. So when I think about high school, I told you I ran track, I did. Our anchor leg was a Olympian in the four by 400 meter relay. And also he played in the NFL for 13 years. He was our anchor leg on my track team. He was the guy that we said, when we give him that dang baton, if he is within five steps of anybody, we won. We already know it. If we give him that baton and he is one step ahead, we're probably going to get some kind of school record. If we give him the baton and he's one step behind, we're, we're golden. It did not matter. Everyone else's task was to make sure when we gave that stick to our anchor leg that he could win. Chiefs, that's us. We're the anchor leg. And what I mean by that is look how our airmen view us. What do they think when they come to the chief? What do they think when they come to the chief? What I'll tell you is you don't need to know everything. You're not going to know everything. You've got to rely on each other. You've got to network while you're here to make sure that when you get that baton, I got you. I got you. We're going to win. And all of our airmen put us in position to win. We work just like our anchor leg. They work for the team. They work for the team to achieve a common goal. That's who you are. That's what we do. Make sense? All right. Heather, what you got? Good morning, Chief. Good morning. Uh, Chief Heather Moody, I am uh, AF Space A1. And as a, a, a personnelist in the community, woo -woo, right? In the community of everything you're talking about, right? Um, I'll be honest, I have a lot of frustration. Um, but with that said, I'd like to give a, a testimony, and I'd like to ask uh, my fellow chiefs for their help on something. Uh, the testimony is what you're talking about. Folks, those aren't words. Um, I can tell you, just like every single one of you in this room, uh, I've had that airman, we've had that airman, that the policy doesn't fit, uh, the response doesn't make sense, and I'm confident it's not how our enterprise wins. I'm confident it's not how our enterprise retains the airmen and takes care of airmen. So from the testimony perspective, I just want to say thank you. You're a man of your word. Um, I can tell you I've called and I have sent this man emails and everything that he just presented is 100% factual. So thank you for what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Hey, thank you all. I am I'm done. I will be down here. If you got any questions about AFPC or things that you're working right now that you need help on, I'll be standing here taking notes, but I want to make sure that we take care of your and your airman needs. Once again, Chiefs, congratulations. Thank you.